Hi, everyone. This is the third video for um, <clears throat> Tuesday of week two. Um, in this video, we are going to talk about the difference between the gram-negative cell envelope and the gram-positive cell envelope. So our last video ended um, after we had explained the structure of peptidoglycan and sort of the mesh network that that created around the cell. I um, want to start this one just talking briefly about the gram stain because we've already said last week that the gram stain differentiates cells into gram negative and gram positive. And then the next thing, of course, is we're going to talk about what the actual structural difference is between gram negative and gram positive cells. So just a reminder, the way the gram stain works is that you fix the cells so they're dead, they're attached to the surface of your slide, and then we add crystal violet and all the cells, um, whatever kind they are, will take up the crystal violet and they would be purple. Now, if we just stain them with crystal violet. Um, the next step in the grand staining procedure is to add iodine to the cells. That iodine um, serves as sort of a fixative to stabilize the crystal violet complex with cellular material. The third step is the critical step. We add ethanol, alcohol, to these cells, and that will solubilize the crystal violet. Um, and this is where the differential part of the gram stain comes in, because gram-positive cells will still, even in the presence of crystal, um, sorry, ethanol, as long as we don't get carried away with it, the purple dye will still stay attached there um, in a stable complex, whereas in gram-negative cells, they won't be able to hold on to the crystal violet, so they will lose the color, right? And now then, um, with these gram-negative cells, if we want to be able to see them on our slide, we have to do something to them, or they won't have the contrast that we need to see them in the bright field microscope. So we add another stain. Sometimes this is called the counter stain. Um, safranin. It's a different color than the crystal violet. So we can see the cells that were only stained at this last stage, right? So now in this protocol, the gram-positive bacteria are the ones that held on to the original crystal violet, so they are purple. The gram-negative bacteria were the ones that lost the crystal violet, and they were counterstained with the pink safranin dye. Okay, so gram-positive and gram-negative. A differential stain, meaning there's something, this staining procedure reveals some structural difference in these two different kinds of cells, okay? So what is that structural difference? Well, gram-positive cells, it turns out, have a thick layer of peptidoglycan. They have multiple layers um, of peptidoglycan glycan strands uh, stacked on top of each other. They also have some other molecules in here called tychoic acids or lipotychoic acids that help to anchor the peptidoglycan to the cell membrane. This is the cytoplasmic membrane down here. And then they can have proteins embedded in this cell wall as well. Okay, now this looks like a solid wall here. It is not solid. It's still permeable to small molecules because nutrients need to be able to get across this to get uh, access to the cytoplasmic membrane to be taken up so that the cell can, can eat essentially. Um, but this is sort of a thick uh, protective layer on the, the surface of a gram-positive cell. There's nothing else out, well, I won't say there's nothing else out here. There can be things like capsules or other things out here, but there's no other membrane out here on the outside of the um, peptidoglycan in a gram-positive cell. Okay, we're going to get to this term periplasmic space uh, in a few minutes when we talk about gram-negative bacteria. Essentially, it's the space in between the cell wall and the surface of the membrane, and that can be dependent on uh, can, environmental conditions as well, okay? So next slide, what do gram-negative cell walls and cell envelopes look like? This is a, an example of a gram-negative cell. I should also have pointed out both on this one and on the previous one, the gram-positive one. This is a transmission EM image of that cell envelope in a 
uh, gram positive cell to the inside of the cell, lipid bilayer, peptidoglycan, and then whatever is outside, whatever happens to be outside that, likewise here. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm getting excited and spitting all over the place. Um, this is in a gram negative bacteria. We actually have two of these lipid bilayers here and the peptidoglycan is in between. And that is shown here in this cartoon image here where we have the cytoplasmic membrane, which for gram-negative bacteria, we often call the inner membrane. Then we have a layer, maybe a couple layers of peptidoglycan, but much thinner than the multiple layers in the gram-positive bacteria. And then here we have another membrane. This is called the outer membrane, all right? This outer membrane, the inner leaflet of that outer membrane, that outer bilayer, the inner leaflet of it, dang it, my phone keeps ringing, sorry, um, is made of similar phospholipids to the inner membrane or the cytoplasmic membrane, um, whereas the outer layer is made of a very different kind of lipid that I'll show you in a second here, right? So two uh, membrane layers, an inner membrane and an outer layer with a thin peptidoglycan layer in between. And the space between the two um, membranes in a um, gram-negative bacteria is referred to as the periplasm. And this is typically larger than it is in a um, gram-positive bacteria, okay? All right, so uh, looking at the outer layer here, this special lipid a little bit more, um, we see that it's a different kind of lipid. Okay, so it has this conserved lipid A structure here. These are the fatty acid tails that go in the hydrophobic interior, but the, um, the, the polar part of it is, is different than most phospholipids. This is a glucosamine um, with phosphate groups attached to it. Um, so we have two glucosamine molecules typically attached to each other, and one of them, instead of having um, the three fatty acid chains, has a polar group that's going to end up sticking out into the, um, the hydrophilic or the aqueous outside environment, right? And this polar group is actually a polysaccharide. That's why this is called a lipopolysaccharide. Um, it can have a variety of different kinds of sugars on here. Often the closest part of this to the um, membrane surface is relatively conserved, this core polysaccharide, and the out, farther out part is less conserved. Okay, so this, um, this outer part here, because it's exposed to the outer environment, if you happen to be a bacteria that is associating with, say, humans, um, this is highly antigenic, meaning that your immune system will recognize it. And because it's also variable, it's not always the same, even in different um, strains from the same species. This is, so this is referred to as the O antigen of in gram-negative pathogens. Um, one other point here is that this entire structure here is also referred to as endotoxin because it is recognized by components of our immune system as, a, as an inflammatory molecule. If these gram-negative bacteria get into your blood where the um, cells of the immune system can access them, that's recognized as a bad thing. Um, and this um, sensing of this molecule will turn up the activity of um, that branch of your immune system. We'll talk about that later in the class, right? So that is lipopolysaccharide. Um, the last thing I want to point out to you um, in this section of the lecture is that because this is a membrane, it also causes challenges for permeability. Nutrients that are that the cell needs to get into the cytoplasm have to cross the outer membrane before they even get a chance to cross the inner membrane. So there have to be transport systems in the outer membrane, just like there were in the inner membrane. Okay, so if we look at some of these transport systems, there's just two of them 
probably the two most important ones in gram-negative bacteria that I want to point out to you. Um, so this is the outer membrane, this is the inner membrane. Um, one of them is these molecules, these proteins called porins. Essentially, these porins create channels for facilitated diffusion. Remember when we were talking about transport across the inner membrane, we said that if there's a, a positive concentration gradient where there's a higher concentration outside than inside, um, the whatever solute molecules are going to want to come into the cytoplasm, but they have to have a path to get there. Um, and so porins are exactly that. There are several different porins that have different size uh, channels. Um, the largest channel is about 600 Dalton. So this is the equivalent to a, um, poly, a an oligosaccharide of maybe four or five sugars, a maybe a tripeptide to a tetrapeptide if you're bringing amino acids in. So not very large molecules. Right, relatively small um, uh, individual sugars or disaccharides, for example, can probably get through porins. There are different porins that have some degree of selectivity in terms of what they allow through, but we won't go here now. So if something comes through a porin, it just gets into the periplasm in a gram-negative bacteria. It still has to have some way of getting into the cytoplasm, all right? And so the rules that we talked about before of getting across the cytoplasmic membrane still apply. Okay, but what about molecules that are not very abundant in the environment where a concentration gradient is not gonna drive them into the cell? Active transport is the solution we talked about earlier. Um, there are, surprisingly, even though there's no ATP in the periplasm, there are versions of active transport that can happen across the outer membrane. The most common of these is called a ton B dependent receptor. The energy that's used actually comes from the uh, cytoplasmic membrane um, and the proton motive force. And the way that works is to put this linker protein, ton B, into a sort of an active confirmation that when an appropriate molecule binds here, it kicks this channel open to bring it into the cell, right? Now there's been a lot of research done on how this works. Um, this can actually be used to bring in somewhat larger molecules than porins are, but it's an active transport process that still requires energy from an energized inner membrane. Okay, so there is both passive and active transport across the outer membrane, but not necessarily in the same way as it happens in the inner membrane. Okay, um, something to point out here is that the outer membrane is an additional protective layer for the um, gram-negative bacteria. And that leads me to ask this question for you to think about, which is that, uh, vancomycin, which is a large antibiotic, a glycopeptide antibiotic with a molecular weight of about 1,500, and lysozyme, which is a protein with a molecular weight of about 14,000, are able to kill Staph aureus strains in the laboratory, but not E. coli in the laboratory. So given some of the things we were just talking about, why is it that Staph is susceptible to both of these and E. coli is susceptible to neither of them? I'm going to end this lecture on that note.